for exactly one more week. I have had the a great many honors over the last nine years here. And um, tonight is uh, a bittersweet celebration. This will be my last honor to uh, introduce the evening speaker at the KIA. So now uh, Dr. Alfreda Merck and I are sort of bound together in this really, <laughs> in this really, really special way. Um, I have um, enjoyed many, 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 many great speakers over the years. And I had the pleasure of having breakfast with Dr. Merck this morning and She's quite special. Uh, I understand why uh, she's great friends with uh, Joy and Tim Light and other friends of the KIAs because she's a marvelous person. So you are in for a treat this evening. I wanna thank you all for joining us for the third annual Joy Light Lecture in East Asian Art. And this program is made possible through the generosity of our dear friends and valued partners, Joy and Tim Light. And the Joy Light East Asian Art Fund is a transformative gift that has allowed us to bring exceptional programming to the West Michigan community, including the lecture you are about to enjoy this evening. This fund also enables us to consistently offer stellar exhibitions. Anyone see the C.C. Wong show downstairs? Like, just raise your hand. Yes, it's fabulous. And anyone see the Wu Jian show upstairs? Yes, it's fabulous. The artist's first solo show in the U.S. So if you haven't missed it, both of these exhibitions are treasures. And I strongly suggest that you enjoy and learn while visiting them. Um, so the fund off, off, offers us the opportunity to bring this incredible programming um, to West Michigan. It also allows us the opportunity to acquire important works of art for the KIA's collection for our community to enjoy. And if you I have an opportunity to visit Unveiling American Genius on the lower level. You will see some of the works um, that are a part of the Asian art collection on view there as well. Um, also, as a part of this uh, incredible platform here, we have as an invaluable resource, Mrs. Joy Light, who brings a wealth of knowledge and passion for the arts and her own uh, network to help us expand our programming. So we want to just express our deepest gratitude for both Joy and Tim for giving us a tremendous gift that really empowers the KIA to educate people of West Michigan about the arts of China, Japan, and Korea. Thank you, thank you so much. We'll keep Joy in our prayers. She's a little under the weather this evening, so I know she would, would she definitely wants to be here this evening, but we'll keep her in our thoughts. Um, in addition to Joy and Tim, we also have a committee of Asian art professionals from around the U.S. who serve on an Asian art advisory committee uh, here at the KIA with us. And so along with the expertise of our chief curator, Rahima Barber, this committee also works to expand our national network and enable us to bring the highest quality programs here to the KIA so that what you are experiencing is equivalent to what you would experience at any leading museum in the US. So please take note of our committee members uh, on the back of your program and also a list of exhibitions we were able to host um, over the following, over the past year and three of the important acquisitions that we were able to um, make for the collection. 
over the past year as well. And so all of these efforts um, really help us to create a momentous uh, amount of programming here at the KIA. This evening, as I mentioned earlier, I do have the very distinct honor of introducing uh, Dr. Alfreda Merck, who joins us to share her deeply thoughtful scholarship on four modern and contemporary artists who have incorporated the written Chinese language into their work in truly unique and meaningful ways. Dr. Merck is an internationally recognized scholar, curator, and historian of Chinese visual culture. She earned her PhD from Princeton University and served as an associate curator of Asian art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art then went on to pursue her scholarship and professional work in Asia for more than two decades. While living in Beijing, she worked at the Palace Museum and taught at both the Central Academy of Fine Arts and Peking University. Dr. Merck is the author of numerous articles as well as the book, Poetry and Painting in Song China, The Subtle Art of dissent. Ooh, we want to read that, don't we? Yes. <laughs> she has contributed to exhibitions at the Royal Academy in London, the Museum of Reitberg in Zurich, the Met, and the China Institute in New York. We are beyond thrilled that Dr. Merck will be offering us the benefit of her experience and insight this evening Please join me in welcoming Dr. Merck in a way that only Kalamazoo can. So a warm, 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 very warm welcome for Dr. Frieda Merck. Thank you so much for that very warm and I'd say excessive <laughs> introduction. Um, it's really my honor to be here. Uh, I'm so impressed by how this KIA has developed since I was last here about 15 years ago. I think it's really uh, incredibly impressive. So congratulations to the staff and thank you for the invitation and thank you all for coming this evening. So. Um, I titled this talk, Weight and Whimsy, because the um, calligraphy that you will see is indeed manipulated in ways that um, make one smile and also um, make you very sober about the fate of Chinese calligraphy in modern China. Um, so calligraphy, that is writing characters with a brush and ink, uh, was an omnipresent feature of daily life in traditional China uh, for everyone who was functionally literate. Uh, calligraphy was indeed the highest of the arts, higher than painting, more highly regarded than painting, with a really complex history of masters and styles and a direct relationship of concepts to, to self-cultivation and the personality. In, the, in fact, it's said that you can tell a person's personality from the way they write. Think about that today, with, even with English writing. Um, so much of that was lost in the 20th century, in the latter half of the uh, 20th century, which poses a really interesting dilemma for artists. How do they deal with the past? And how do they think about the long history of Chinese writing and the recent events of their own lives? Now, Wang Feng Yu, our first artist, um, who you see on the far left, uh, took a very painterly approach to brushing characters, and his work is still in the grand tradition of Chinese calligraphy. Uh, the other three artists uh, were all born during the um, uh, People's Republic of China, and they create works that are not calligraphy per se, but rather use the Chinese language for critical and ironic commentaries on politics, on culture, and on the long history of language itself. So China has modernized, and many of the, as it modernized, many of the distinctive features of visual culture, 
um, have been discarded. People wear Western suits, sports clothes, and jeans. One-story courtyards have been replaced with steel and glass towers. Narrow streets and whole neighborhoods have been bulldozed uh, for um, boulevards. Calligraphy as a fine art um, is no longer has no longer has the preeminent position that it did in dynastic times. Uh, the written language is, however, the most enduring feature of Chinese visual culture. Yet it is no longer necessary to write with a brush in daily life or in one's artistic practice. So how have artists responded to this momentous shift? Uh, Wang Feng Yu uh, was born in 1913 into an intellectual family in Beijing. He was tutored at home and then in the Catholic University in Beijing. He came to the United States in 1945 and earned a master's degree from Columbia University. He taught Chinese language and literature at Yale University from 1946 uh, to 1965. And in fact, when I first studied Chinese in Hong Kong, we listened to tapes in the language lab and it was Wang Fang Yu's voice that we were listening to. Um, so there, after he left Yale, he joined the faculty of Seton Hall, where he developed the first computer system to teach Chinese. Now in this scroll, he has written the character for antiquity with a long, heavy brushstroke. Um, the bottom character is Jin or today. So it's the weight of the past heavily <laughs> pressing down on fragile today on the uh, present. Uh, so Wang Feng Yu, late into his life, became a master at manipulating characters to play on their early pictographic forms um, and their meanings. Here we see uh, the, his interpretation of horse, a running horse. So I'm going to give you a brief history of the character horse. Uh, in uh, oracle bones from about 3,100 years ago, one sees this pictogram of the horse rearing up with its mane flying, its tail flying. You can even see its eye. And um, over the centuries, as uh, various states warred against each other, the character for horse was written in all those different ways that you see at the lower left. And then Qin Shi Huang, uh, the megalomaniac uh, autocrat came along and he had his minister, Li Si, unify the language. And so uh, the character that you see in the middle at the bottom is his version of horse. You still see the mane flying, right? And then uh, the modern character at the lower right is um, uh, still retains that suggestion of the mane and the four hooves hitting the ground. So when Wang Feng Yu uh, does his version of horse, uh, it is a flying, lilting horse. Um, so all of you who have studied Chinese will, be rec will recognize this tonal exercise from first year Chinese. So Ma, is horse. And if you add a woman radical, then you get mama, mother. And uh, the word for hemp is doesn't have horse involved, but it's ma, and then ma, and ma, with the four little box, the three little boxes on the top is the word for curse. So you can say, and then um, the last one with the mouth radical on the left is the question word. So you can say, mama, mama, ma. <laughs> Didn't mother curse the horse? Mama, ma, ma, ma. Um, anyway, so this is one of the problems. These are called homophones, that is words that are all pronounced the same. And we'll see why this is a problem as Chinese is modernized in the 20th century. So Wang Feng Yu did other wonderful interpretations of characters. So I think you can probably guess which of these characters suggests water, which one suggests 
the tortoise, and which one is thoughts floating along? So thoughts is this wonderful floating thing. <laughs> you can imagine he's thinking in different directions. And then water suggests the, in fact, the one of the characters that was drawn on oracle bones 3,000 years ago, and then the tortoise, which actually is quite close to the modern um, writing of tortoise with all its many characters. Now, our second artist was born uh, rather late, 1969. So I'm not taking these uh, artists in chronological order, but I wanted to show uh, Chojirjia next because he did these wonderfully interesting, interesting riffs on tradition, most traditional Chinese masterpiece. But here we see him in his sensational um, uh, 19, um, this would have been about 1994 when he did these tattoo images. Uh, so both the word for no in Chinese at the lower left and then the um, international symbol for no written on his body and then onto the wall. So he had to stand very still in the right position for the camera to capture those uh, words, uh, both inscribed across his body and then um, onto the wall. And at the uh, right, you see him in his studio in 2018 in, in Beijing. Um, so we have to review what the Lan Ting, or the, rather the Orchid Pavilion prefaces because it is the great moment when Chinese calligraphy blossoms as a unique masterpiece. Uh, so what happened was uh, Wang Shijie and his friends gathered in 353 CE uh, at a pavilion called the Orchid Pavilion. And uh, they were there in the springtime to write poems and to drink wine. And if they did not write a poem, they were to take a penalty of a cup or two of wine that was floated down the stream on those uh, lotus leaves, or whatever those leaves were. And Wang Shijie sits in the um, pavilion watching them all. And at the end of the afternoon, everyone was very mellow. They gathered the poems together. He transcribed them. And then he wrote a preface. And the preface, uh, is um, a long, well, a, an essay that became one of the great classics of Chinese calligraphy. Um, so as a high school student, Cho Jie had to study this uh, piece of calligraphy. Everyone had to study it because it is considered the great masterpiece. Um, and uh, of this piece, uh, the great authority on Chinese calligraphy, said, um, described it. <laughs> if I can find it. Oh, it's, uh, this is Lothar Later Rose, and he says, its aesthetic quality lay in its masterful combination of firm precision with graceful ease. So see if you can see these qualities in the image. The constant variations in the shape of the strokes, the free yet balanced composition of the characters, the easy flow in the lines, as well as, as the lively spacing in the entire composition, worked together to produce an artistic rhythm that set a standard for centuries to come. And he went on, the characters, which occur more than once, and here I've marked some of them, always show a different form. This illustrates that the piece was written in complete spontaneity as the outflow of a unique and felicitous moment of creation, end quote. So Wang Shijie was so thrilled with his calligraphy that the next day he sat down to write other passages with the same kind of graceful elan. He tried multiple times, but could not capture that special quality of you know, relaxed spontaneity that he had had on the day before 
when he was intoxicated with the weather, the company, and no doubt, multiple cups of wine. So the original masterpiece is in a tomb, it is said, of a Tang Dynasty emperor who coveted that piece of calligraphy. And he had an agent go and trick the collector into letting him see it. And then the agent swept it up and said, this is for the emperor. And he tore back to uh, the capital. And then the emperor had his best calligraphers copy it. And he took the best examples and had them carved into stone, like, like a tombstone. So that there were master craftsmen who could etch the characters into stone. And here are examples of uh, those kinds of uh, etchings. And the reason that the characters are white and uh, the background is black is because these are ink squeezes. These are ink press. So I'll show how you how that's done. Uh, in the Beilin in Xi'an, if you visit, or if you have visited, you will see craftsmen spreading uh, paper onto steely that have characters carved on them. And this is very sturdy Shren paper, uh, so made from mulberry pie. So it doesn't break even when it's stretched and, and brushed out. Maybe you can even see that there are characters beneath it. And the, there's a, a brush that they use. And so here's then what happens next. It gets tamped. So ink is put on the paddle. The tamper is filled with ink. And then the characters magically appear. This is not Wang Shizhi. This is a great calligrapher from the Northern Song. But you get the idea. Um, so Chou Zhijie, when he wrote out his Orchid Pavilion preface over and over again, rather than use different pieces of paper, he copied the text on top of his original on the same piece of paper. And the preface soon became illegible. So the work mirrors what happened to calligraphy's place in the arts of, and life of China in the late 20th century. <clears throat> the most famous and still recognizable masterpiece gradually became less recognizable and was eventually completely effaced. So the third artist I want to show to you is uh, uh, Zhang Huan, a very eccentric guy who was born into a poor family in Henan province in uh, the town of Anyang, uh, an ancient city that was uh, the site of, of the capital of seven dynasties over the centuries. Um, <clears throat> when he was about one year old, his parents sent him off to live with his uh, grandparents in the countryside, so even poorer area. And um, life was very hard. There was very little food. They scraped along on uh, root vegetables and corn, and education was rudimentary. But he had a talent for um, art, and he started taking art classes at age 14. At age 16, he left home for art school. And then in 1991, in his mid-20s, he moved to Beijing, still very poor. <laughs> he says that several times he was evicted from an apartment with, where he couldn't pay the rent. And um, with no money, he ended up living with other artists in a ramshackle house in what the residents, the art, art uh, students called uh, the East Village, named after New York's East Village. Um, and there he did what he called poor artist performances. That is performances where he suffered, but uh, he could sell the photographs afterwards. <laughs> so he gathered uh, friends together. And uh, this was a riff on cultural revolution uh, processes where Mao Zedong um, 
just through thousands of people, tens of thousands of people at a project to move a mountain, to uh, build the uh, Shersanling Reservoir outside uh, Beijing. So John Huang had his friends wade into this pond with the idea that they would raise the level of the pond. So this is a kind of send up a, a joke. And then at the right, you see him sitting in a toilet and the title of the work, 12 square meters, is a reference to the size of the public toilet where he was sitting. He put fish oil and honey on his body and flies naturally gathered. And he sat there for a couple hours and uh, he has a beautiful body. So <laughs> his, the photographs that were taken uh, were, um, and the videos that were taken were uh, easy to sell. Um, so the Cultural Revolution impacted all of these artists. And uh, one of the interesting things is that calligraphy itself uh, got dumbed down to these big blocky characters, uh, which didn't allow any individuality. Um, Mao Zedong uh, urged students to smash the four olds. And during that time, there was a lot of destruction of um, uh, property uh, and of um, human lives. So these events impact him, impacted him, but he didn't realize the degree to which they impacted him until he went to New York in 1998. And then he became intensely aware of his Chineseness and of the kinds of things that were in his mind that uh, he couldn't communicate to other people and no one could understand all of these unique names and um, titles of Mao essays and um, places that were part of his identity. And he had, this is part of his identity crisis. But once he had a friend write all of these things on, on his face, his face as a canvas, uh, somehow that helped um, resolve this, or at least help, maybe helped it resolve the crisis. Um, so you see, he also encouraged his uh, friends and colleagues uh, to help with this project. And actually, this is a characteristic of a lot of the successful artists in China today. They have uh, friends and colleagues who collaborate, and if they have enough money, they employ assistance. Um, so his uh, family story, as he called it, it became nine um, uh, chromographic prints. And uh, my husband and I, who lived in Beijing at the time, thought about acquiring uh, the set, but it was impossibly expensive. Even buying one was not uh, possible. So uh, there's no question that Zhang Han uh, has become a great artistic success um, and economic success. But it's interesting that uh, like Zhou Zhijie's transcription of the preface to the Lanting Pavilion poetry, the names and dates and uh, essay titles continued to be written on his face until his face was obliterated. And he, at one point he commented, I often find myself in conflict with the environment I live in and feel my existence is intolerable. When these problems arise, I find that my body is the only direct approach that allows me to feel the world and also let the world know me. Um, so he had these chromographic prints printed at huge size. They were shown in uh, various um, museums and galleries. And he has since um, become a, or maybe he was already then, a serious Buddhist. He and his wife are a, Buddhist practitioners, and you see at the lower right um, an image of a skull that was created with different tonalities of ash from burning incense. And this ash was collected in quantities from temples around Shanghai. 
and he's done a whole series of ash paintings with these, um, with that material. And he now has a huge studio in Shanghai with over a hundred assistants. And uh, he is there in his studio grounds posing in a tree. Um, and at the lower left, you see one of his huge sculptures uh, that is uh, again, like so many of his works, a meditation on ephemerality and on the uh, limitations of life and uh, decay. Um, so our fourth artist, I've saved Xu Bing for the last, even though he is the eldest of these artists. He was born in 1955 in Chongqing in Sichuan province. Um, the family moved to Beijing when he was just a toddler, just two years old. And his father became a professor at Peking University teaching history. And his mother uh, worked in the library. His father gave him an assignment every day to write calligraphy, um, a poem or a short essay. Um, and so calligraphy was a formative experience for Xu Bing. And this was long before computers or word processing software was even thought of. Um, so it was, calligraphy was a very personal thing for him. Uh, during the Cultural Revolution, the family was split up. Uh, Xu Bing was sent to the countryside at age 18. He seemed to, in fact, enjoy uh, getting to know the peasants in his village and uh, he learned from them the farming tasks. I love this little study he did from a hill, on top of a hill looking down into a courtyard house uh, with ducks and, um, and a various fowl, uh, and a pig I think is there. Um, it's not easy to do that kind of, if you've, been a, if you've ever drawn, you know that this is not an easy thing to do. Um, he found, however, a lot of his neighbors uh, were completely illiterate. They didn't know how to write and or read a character, uh, or maybe they could read 10, but not much. And this was a problem for the government of the new uh, People's Republic of China. Um, in the 1950s, how could you promote literacy among this totally uneducated population? So they had several approaches. One was in the wintertime when the farmers were free, were not uh, tending their fields. Uh, Chinese classes were held uh, to encourage them to learn characters. And for city people, they also, of course, wanted uh, literacy uh, because how could you uh, convey your communist doctrines without people being able to read? So they had uh, they even issued guidelines that um, uh, countryside people should learn 1,500 characters. So there are 50,000 characters, but you only need um, about, what, 3,000, 3,500 to read a newspaper. And um, <laughs> Xu Bing says, if you have 4,000, you are an intellectual. Um, so people in the in the cities were supposed to learn uh, 2,000 characters. Uh, and then they could read simple newspapers, simple articles. Um, another ch uh, challenge was that throughout China, there were dozens of different dialects. There are the major dialects. And then villages had different pronunciation from the next village over the mountain. So a team of scholars came up with pinyin spelling based on northern Mandarin, on Beijing Mandarin Chinese. Interestingly, Cantonese lost out by just two votes. <laughs> Can you imagine if we were all learning? Uh, anyway, Cantonese is more complicated because it has more than four tones. Anyway, um, so in these posters, they have opinion spelling underneath the characters so that once you read the character, or I mean, if you can't pronounce the characters, the opinion is there to help you. 
There was one scholar or a couple scholars who wanted to turn Chinese into a totally um, uh, alphabetic language. Um, and that meant, uh, you know, Korea had actually done this with their Hangul. Um, so why could it not work for Chinese? Remember the ma, 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 ma. It, there are too many homonyms. Um, and that's just one instance. The language is full of homonyms. There's another rhyme about a, 10 tigers. Um, anyway, it's 10 stone tigers, aren't they? <laughs> so I won't recite that one. Um, at any rate, uh, that became um, a non-starter. Uh, but then they turned to simplifying characters, make it easier to write. So here we have some examples of uh, simplified characters. So uh, Ling is simplified to a few. I still find it difficult to use these, to register these simplified characters. And in fact, uh, exams of drivers in Japan found that they could recognize the full form faster than they could the simplified forms. J Japan has a different set of simplified forms. Okay, so at any rate, I show you a wash basin that was uh, a gift in 1956 from the Tianjin city government to social activists. And uh, so it has a, a wonderful combination of full form and simplified characters. Okay, so Xu Bing took on uh, this um, uh, challenge. He, was, he entered uh, with the class, the first class that entered uh, colleges after the Cultural Revolution, uh, which ended in 1976. So 1978 was the first class. And while he was there, the American philosopher and literary critic Frederick Jameson taught a course at Peking University on art theory and postmodernism. Um, Jameson's lectures were translated into Chinese and published in 1986. And postmodernism, this idea of iconoclastic, who decides what's a canon anyway? You know, who, who gets to decide that? Uh, it became a fashionable uh, catchword and it inspired all kinds of strange installations and performances and absurdist videos like a scholar washing, giving a bath to a chicken over an hour. And another video was three hours long of an artist reassembling a broken mirror. So the goal was to reject the past, to challenge the received definition of art and artistic canons. So Xu Bing took on uh, the Chinese language and this modernization, simplification of characters. He designed and carved 4,000 pseudo characters on wood blocks. He then printed huge sheets of paper and assembled them in as if they were lavishly produced traditional books. The process, the process was ostentatiously traditional and labor intensive. And the characters looked like Chinese, but they were in fact impossible to read. Nevertheless, the viewers who were lit literate in Chinese could not help but try to read these characters. Really interesting um, to decipher them, um, making the work really compelling. Um, so Book from the Sky established Xu Bing as a prominent figure in the avant-garde um, and as an iconoclastic uh, artist. So he printed on these huge sheets that were hung from the ceiling. And then below you see all the various books that he printed. Um, he had wanted to study oil painting at the Central Academy, but they assigned him to the print department. And so that uh, inspired him to learn how to do these various printings. So Book from the Sky was Xu Bing's um, commentary on the difficulty of reading esoteric, unpunctuated texts of the Chinese classics. He had, he took China's most 
universally recognized form, the Chinese character, um, and created pseudo characters that in proportion and balance look plausible. He chose 4,000, as I mentioned, because you, if you learn uh, 4,000, you are considered an intellectual. But his project completely undermines the idea um, of literacy and raises questions about the access of contemporary Chinese to the written record of their past and their understanding of their language and art. So this meticulous work was admired uh, by some. Uh, at the opening in 1988, a book from the sky was condemned by some elder critics um, who saw it as a terrible and elaborate stunt, a joke that was disrespectful to Chinese language and culture. Um, the following year, this is very, a very interesting time. As you'll recall, in 1989, there were demonstrations in Tiananmen Square that began with a request for better food in the cafeteria and, <laughs> and other rather mundane requests and turned into a huge uh, movement for democracy, um, a more equitable society. So the students gathered in Tiananmen Square for several months, uh, making speeches, refusing to leave until government leaders promised economic reforms. Uh, the Central Academy of Fine Arts students created the goddess of democracy that you see in the far distance there. And they purposely made it large so that it could not be simply removed, quickly removed from the square, but had to be destroyed, which it was. The army was ordered to clear the square the night of June 4th, resulting in the unimaginable, the shooting of innocent students and other peaceful demonstrators, and the killing went on through the night and the following morning. Um, so on the right, you see the project that Xu Bing conceived for the anniversary, June 1990, the first anniversary of this terrible massacre. And what he showed, um, so that at that time, he was a 34-year-old junior faculty member at the Central Academy. Um, so he planned this project of making an ink rubbing, normally used for small calligraphic pieces or steely. He chose a very large object, a 100-foot stretch of the Great Wall. And during the month of May 1990, on the one-year one anniversary of the massacre, Xu Bing was out at the Great Wall, working with a team of 15 students and local farmers. Um, he must have been exceedingly relieved to be on um, the, out in the countryside, away from the very tense atmosphere in Beijing. He described the project as a grand art happening he said, quote, I hope to experience the process of expending great effort for a meaningless result, end quote. Uh, the process was documented in drawings and endless monotonous video of the sound and motion of repeated pounding of ink pads, like we saw on the wall, uh, over sheets of paper held against the wall. A spokesman from the Ministry of Culture connected Book from the Sky and the ink rubbing of the Great Wall. He bitterly attacked uh, Xu Bing. Um, his attack was published in an official newspaper two days before the anniversary of the first year of the um, massacre. Uh, the article condemned Xu Bing as a representative of anti-art and anti-tradition and anti-intellectual with anti-social tendencies. Uh, so Xu Bing quickly uh, packed up the rubbings and accepted the invitation from the University of Michigan uh, to be a visiting artist for a year or two. So he moved uh, to Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I'm sorry, not the University of Michigan, the University of Wisconsin. Um, 
uh, and there he and the museum staff reassembled these rubbings and um, from uh, sheets of paper that he meticulously numbered. You can imagine from seeing the book from the sky that how careful Xu Bing was with his projects. Um, in So it was shown in various venues. I saw it in uh, Beijing in, 19, in 2018, a grand retrospective of Xu Bing's art. He's really amazing. So he moved to New York in 1992 and shared an apartment with Ai Weiwei. Um, so the top two photographs you saw Ai Weiwei taking Xu Bing eating a bowl of noodles. And both of them were struggling to learn English. Uh, and that inspired Xu Bing to create share square word calligraphy. So he created a writing style that configured the alphabet, the, the Western alphabet, like Chinese characters. And here you see a practice sheet, just like the ones done in um, for Chinese calligraphy. And uh, I don't know if you can make out or not, but the student is copying little Bo Peep. Um, and some of them are more complicated, but you see that men is M-E-N and women is W, so it looks like the character for a mountain actually, W-O-M-E-N. Um, and he took great delight in this uh, process. Um, then for his next large series, he combined uh, uh, students of Chinese who begin to study Chinese may have been as charmed as I was at how easy it is to combine characters to create another character, another related meaning. So sun and tree combined are east because the sun rises beyond the trees on the east. And then uh, tree, mu combined together with another image of tree is a grove or, well, anyway, a small group of trees. And then you add a third tree and you have a forest. And similarly for stone, for sure, you put three together and you have a pile of stones. And then mountain is three peaks together. So Shubing used this very graphic uh, uh, way of writing a landscape. He used the characters to write a landscape. So you can kind of make out a uh, tree and stone and even grass. And uh, sometimes he adds, uh, oh, at the very top you, of the mountain, there is mountain, the old uh, form of three peaks for a mountain. And uh, then he'll sometimes write, uh, he has, I know that, these, that's the character for house, and that's a house. So he had great fun with these, combining all these characters to create what he called land script. And uh, similarly, he used the ancient form of water that you saw in Wang Feng Yu's uh, calligraphy uh, to create all these leaping, uh, swirling waves around a little rocky island. And on the island, he has not only sure for the stones, and um, uh, he even writes the colors. There's black in there, and then at the uh, right hand end, he has the reflection coming off the water. So it's uh, just a playful series, and he did a large number of these, just endlessly uh, uh, creative in combining characters to make these little landscapes. And then finally, in reaction to the um, book from the sky that no one could read, he developed with his assistants all of these symbols 
these he swears that these are all internationally gathered symbols, um, uh, little icons uh, that everyone can understand. His, the alarm goes off. The sleepy guy finally gets up and turns on the light. And oh, it's seven o'clock. He has to run and get. It. And then he puts in parentheses uh, the uh, thinking of the um, uh, character. Uh, so he gets out of bed. He goes to the bathroom. He takes a shower. He bakes. It, he cooks his breakfast. He's eating his breakfast, and he's thinking about, ah, cocktail time. He's going to take this gal to cocktails, but oh, I don't know, there's doesn't, then his coffee gets cool and then he realizes, oh my gosh, I've got to get to work. So anyway, these stories are ones that everyone can uh, read. And um, so the artists we have looked at all have reacted in uh, different ways to this dilemma of um, the language being transformed and no longer valid uh, or no longer practiced in daily life. Uh, so um, they're all thinking about the weight of the past on the present. Um, Chojirje has demonstrated the burden of the long and admired tradition of great brush writing um, and asks how an artist today should confront it. Um, in Family Story, John Juan was grappling with his identity in a foreign culture. Um, and a foreign culture that couldn't comprehend the slogans and stories that were drilled into his head as a youth. So his identity, he discovered, was inextricably tied to that language of the revolution and the recent past. Um, and he chose to represent these on his body um, as part of his identity. And Xu Bing's book from the sky is embedded in Chinese culture, um, an iconoclastic meditation on the relationship of the past and the present and the future. Wang Feng Yu, our oldest of the three, uh, four artists, summed up in this one image, uh, these two characters, the dilemma of Chinese artists and of China generally. How do you deal with the past? The gu, the past, is there and it's weighing on us. How do we deal with it? Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take questions if you have any. I'll try to answer them. Yes. Um, I had a question about the artist that put the characters on his face. Yes. Do you know if he shows those characters that have meaning to him? Yes, they definitely have meaning. Uh, they are uh, uh, one of the things that you can see, in fact, in the image on the program, you can see that uh, you can make out the character. <laughs> Those who are literate can <laughs> make out the characters. And they are, some of them are just nam names of friends. Some are names of places. Uh, one is the name of one of Mao's famous essays that they had to memorize as a child. Every, all uh, people had to memorize uh, Mao's, there are three essays that had to be memorized. Um, and you had to recite them if you were asked. Um, so yeah, the Cultural Revolution uh, really uh, impacted young people, especially young people. Um, Xu Bing was uh, older, and although he was impacted, he had much more of a self-identity before uh, the Cultural Revolution. Yes. I'm wondering if you're going to go back to the slide of the original preface yeah, on the left hand side, there are two characters that are very blackened, and I'm wondering, was that some kind of yeah, yeah, that's really uh, a good question. In fact, 
uh, he made a mistake. And so he just uh, blotted it out. And yeah, yeah, you know, it's just, uh, this was just an afternoon, you know, writing for his friends, not a big deal. Um, in more often there, they will just put a little indication next to it that it's wrong and then write the correct, correct uh, character below. Um, but yeah, he just um, obliterated. And I didn't point out, but uh, it's circled. The first character of the whole essay is Yong, the uh, part of the rain name, Yonghe, uh, forever peace um, or long lasting peace. Uh, and it has eight strokes in it. And those are the basic strokes for Chinese calligraphy. Uh, you learn those eight strokes, you learn how to write those, and it all, I mean, with some little minor exceptions, that's, those are, that's how you write Chinese characters. So that's why uh, Wang Shijir studied that for 15 years. <laughs> So I'm happy to take any question. No question is invalid. All are possible. On this question of pinyin, that translation could have often signified language. Uh, is that a correlation to the to the mechanization of the modern day Chinese? Yes, yes. So the question is, how does pinyin relate to the romanization system relate to uh, technology today? And it's very critical because that's how you now spell, that's how you communicate. So everyone in China now has on their phone pads Western characters, alphabet, to print, to, to type out uh, pinyin words. And then the character pops up. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, the opinion is universal in China now. If you want to communicate to your grandchild, you better learn pinyin. Uh, so um, uh, also on computers, you can type. And now the the translation software is getting better and better. Uh, Google Translate is actually pretty good, and even better is DeepL. There, it's just amazing. Even with classical Chinese, there, it's pretty good. So you know, the, in my lifetime, this digital revolution is extreme. It's it's a different world today. Uh, you know, um, if you didn't know a character when I was studying Chinese you figured out what its radical was, what classifier it was, and then you go to the dictionary and you go to that radical, and then you count the number of strokes next to the radical, and then you look under that number of strokes, and then you eventually find the character. I mean, you know, it could take half an hour to find the character you want, <laughs> but you don't know. Yes. <laughs> Yes. So the question is, uh, are, do some of these artists think about calligraphy as uh, in terms of materiality? That is, 
uh, she says she's she writes with pen on paper, writes Chinese characters, but I bet you also text occasionally, yes, <laughs> with Weibo or uh, WeChat. So um, yes, in fact, uh, uh, Xu Bing's uh, uh, book from the ground, the one with all of the international symbols is a reflection on that. And um, also, um, even his book from the sky, he's carving these pseudo characters into pear wood, um, but it's a, it's a send up of the uh, traditional um, uh, way of uh, treating um, calligraphy. And then he himself also has been do doing digital art um, and uh, really interesting projects. Um, Zhang Huan has done, uh, after that family story, he has done less uh, with calligraphy, although it still occasionally appears in his work, but he's, he's not as interested in uh, the language as uh, Xu Bing. So I think there, there's definitely, a, a, there's another artist who burns characters into paper. So you have the character, but it's completely a hole in the paper. It doesn't exist. And that is also an interesting um, uh, new relationship to the Chinese language. Mm -hmm. What efforts are there? Is the university system and the cultural system in China making to preserve the beauties of calligraphy? Can um, you still work? Uh, is it taught? Do people study it? Uh, so it's a specialized art. Uh, if you are an artist, you're funneled into an art program. So it's not uh, an option for those who are studying history or science. But in the art programs, their calligraphy is studied as a kind of esoteric art. That is, it's, and it, it, curiously, uh, there was a suggestion by some very prominent people that uh, school children be taught full form characters so that they can read uh, things from the past. But uh, the education department, the Department of Education rejected that. So they aren't, no one is taught full form characters. But if they're smart and, and ambitious, they will find ways to, to learn full form. But so there, there are courses that teach calligraphy and uh, calligraphy appreciation. There's a terrible gap. Oh, it's, a, it's an extreme gap. It's extreme, yeah. No one has to, I mean, I'm very happy to hear that someone is actually putting pen to paper because it's not even necessary now. You have your laptop and you can print out whatever you want. And anyway, it's, yeah, there, there are kids who don't, who don't have muscle memory to even write simple characters like, um, war like I. So it's a it's a problem. It's a different world. We have here today people aren't teaching cursive. Right, yes. Anyway. Yes. So earlier today we were talking a little bit about how um, Chinese painting often contains such obscure or obscured messages. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could apply this Notion of obscurity to a couple of the artists that you've shared with us. Yeah, so the, the artists today um, are not working in the same way that I was explaining to you, in that where when an artist is exiled and has to high, communicate his meanings through very obscure metaphors. Um, these most of these artists actually have been self exiling. Um, Xu Bing now lives and works in New York. Um, Zhang Huan has a big uh, uh, studio in ha in uh, Shanghai, but he he also travels a great deal. Um, 
Wang Feng Yu is no longer with us. Anyway, it's a, um, there are a number of artists who are now in the United States or in Europe. And uh, so by removing themselves from China, they don't have to be so scrupulously careful about what they express. So I think it's, it's a different situation, yeah. Do you have Mandarin as a language of choice? Do I? Do you have Mandarin as a language of choice? Oh, in China? Yeah. In China, no. Uh, Mandarin is now the national language. Yeah. It's, it's not called Mandarin. It's called the people's language, the ordinary language, the general language, Putonghua. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well, I'm happy to take uh, questions from you individually. Let's, <laughs> let's call it a time. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this evening's lecture. I will encourage you to uh, check sightlines for some other exciting events that are coming up. And um, we will be around for a few more minutes if you'd like to come up and speak with Dr. Merck. But before we depart this evening, we do have a very special, special gift for you on behalf of the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts and the entire team here at the KIA who helped make Thank everything so we do much. possible. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. The hospitality has been exemplary. Thank you all.